Hello and welcome to White Fight, a conference on politics and ideology in militaries and armed groups, brought to you by the Center for War Studies of University College Dublin. I am Yanis Korsalakis, the lead organizer of this event, and the Marie Curie Fellow here at UCD. The purpose of this conference is to consider the ways in which particular sets of political ideas, values, or mentalities have shaped military practice over the 20th century. The talks you're about to watch have been pre-recorded by our participants and will remain available here in history. There are 12 papers in total organized in four thematic panels. Our speakers examine a broad range of topics from naval officers in the Russian Civil War to the use of paramilitaries by the Rhodesian government during Zimbabwe's War of Liberation. Professors Pierre Asselin and Junke Nigel will deliver keynote talks that will be recorded on the day of the conference and also made available in history. We are gathered here for our second keynote, which will be delivered by Professor Pierre Aslan of Santiago State University. So Professor Aslan is a specialist in the Vietnam War from a Vietnamese perspective, and he's written a number of books and articles on the subject, the, the latest of which is, I believe, Vietnam's American War. And he's going to be talking to us today about uh, communist military strategy in the Vietnam War or Vietnam's American War. So Professor Aslan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Yanis, for this for this introduction and for 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 this chance to to be with you. Uh, it's not it's, it's certainly not uh, uh, you know an, an ideal format, but but it will have to do. Besides, I'm sure that just like me by this time, you enjoy Zoom as much as 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 my my, my colleagues. Uh, I've never delivered an address without shoes on, so this is also a first for me. Um, and uh, but but uh, seriously, it's it's a it's it's a real it's a real honor uh, to be to be delivering this 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 address. I'm 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 uh, uh, genuinely humbled by by uh, the invitation, Yanis, and and to be to be amongst you to discuss. Uh, I think uh, a, a topic that 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 you know is 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 quite significant given the prominence of the Vietnam War, um, but but which I think. Uh, a lot of, of um, scholars misunderstand or have misrepresented. Um, uh, in, in the United States in particular, um, we've, we've written at length about, about, about the war in, in Vietnam, um, but strangely, uh, the focus has been almost um, exclusively uh, the American experience. And, and you know, as, as, as we all know, um, the Vietnamese played a very, very important role um, in, in, in their own conflict, really. Um, and, and what I'm going to suggest today is actually the Americans were, kinds of, were, were kind of interlopers in, in, in an ongoing Vietnamese civil war. Um, having said that, um, I've, I've been researching the, the, the communist experience, if you will, the, 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 the experiences of the other side in the Vietnam War for, for um, over two decades. Uh, and I've been doing this on the basis of materials collected from, from Vietnam. Um, I, 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 under normal circumstances, I go to Vietnam at least once a year uh, to research the archives there. Um, it's challenging, obviously, because it's a communist state, but, but um, uh, by now I'm on relatively good terms with um, a lot of good and important people, and that's helped uh, in terms of getting access to, to, to interesting and revealing materials. So, so what I want to do today, uh, consistent with the themes of this of this of this of this great conference, is to give you an insight into 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 what was at stake for for Hanoi for for, for the communist leadership in in the Vietnam War, uh, but also um, um, tell you more about what was at stake for for individual men and women um, who who fought on behalf of of communist authorities in 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 the Vietnam War. Um, to give you an insight into why why these men and women fought in in the war uh, against 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 the, the the Americans and their and their and their allies, uh, I've entitled the presentation "Determined to Fight, Determined to Win," uh, because this was a very very popular slogan uh, that was introduced and then used by Hanoi to mobilize its forces and its people and to rally them really behind behind the war effort um, and and essentially the equivalent in Vietnamese. 
uh, is, is, is right here. It's Quetin, Quetang, right? Determined to fight, determined to win. Uh, and and th this is this this is one of those slogans that that, that the Communist Party would, would kind of reiterate ad nauseum during 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 the war again as a means of mobilizing of rallying of of of, of inspiring both its armed forces but also its its civilian population. I've also interspersed my presentation from images uh, that I've that I've with some images that I've, that I've gotten from the archives, from the Vietnamese archives. So, so, so while you may have seen some of the photos in this presentation, there's a number of them uh, that, 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 that I've, I've never seen anywhere else because, because they were drawn from the archives um, in, 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 in Hanoi. Uh, now, uh, there's, there's something, you know, talk about misunderstandings, right? I, I think that, that, uh, we, we've had a, a bad tendency in the West to romanticize Ho Chi Minh as, 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 as a Vietnamese nationalist. Um, and, and what we uh, who have been working on Vietnam for quite some time now are, are, are realizing is that, is, that, is that first and foremost, Ho Chi Minh was a committed Marxist-Leninist um, who, who recognized early on that, that it would be much easier to achieve his core objectives by presenting himself as, as a nationalist. And so, so as, as some of you might know, throughout the American war, the so-called American war, uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, and other uh, communist leaders uh, will make the claim that they're merely fighting for the reunification of their country, right? That, that ultimately, you know, the, 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 the so-called Vietnamese revolution, including this effort against the Americans um, is, 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 is a nationalist effort. That, that, that's not really true. Uh, as it turns out, um, from, from, from the time of the founding of the Communist Party uh, in, in, in 1930, that party uh, became committed to the realization of three objectives, uh, only the first one of which was the one that we're most familiar with, right? And, and the one that it would kind of, you know, uh, 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 publicized quite, 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 quite widely. But, but so, you know, to understand why the communists fought the French and then fought the Americans, it's very important to understand what those, those goals or those phases in their revolutionary struggle um, um, were. And so, so, so the first goal, um, uh, and again, this is very consistent with, 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 with Marxist-Leninist Soviet revolutionary and Chinese revolutionary principles, right? So, so, so the first goal at the time of the founding of the party in 1930 was to was to by in communist parlance to liberate vietnam and to reunify vietnam right um uh when when the french took over indochina one of the things they did was subdivide vietnam into three different constituent parts in part because they were trying to 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 to, to mitigate uh uh, uh the, the, the the potentially adverse effects of of, of, of vietnamese nationalism so, 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 so in 1930, the, the, the Indo-Chinese Communist Party, which becomes the Vietnamese Communist Party, uh, will, 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 will develop its platform, its grand strategy, if you will. And, and, and phase one uh, will, will, will be, according to, 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 to its, own, its own manifesto, that again, the, the liberation of Vietnam and the, the reunification of the three parts of Vietnam, which, which in communist parlance really is, is the so-called bourgeois nationalist revolution, right? And, 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 and very often when, when, when we, for example, in the US teach about the Vietnam War, this is what we make the communist effort, the anti-American effort all about. And that's wrong. That's very, very wrong. That's only phase one. Phase two, which is arguably the most critical one for Vietnam, was that, was that once the, the foreigners had been expelled, right, the French and later on the Americans and the country reunified, then, 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 then the party would proceed with a so-called socialist revolution, which essentially entailed fighting, taking on domestic enemies and purifying uh, a, a local society, right? So, so phase two of the Vietnamese revolutionary struggle essentially entailed the elimination of so-called reactionary classes and, and the creation of an, of an egalitarian society through the collectivization of agriculture on the one hand and the nationalization of industry on, on, on the other. And again, right, uh, it, it, you know, in terms of this debate about Ho Chi Minh being a nationalist or a communist, it's very, very clear that, 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 that the moment that these communists would achieve goal number one anywhere, 
they would then shortly afterwards proceed with goal number two, demonstrating again their commitment to, to, to this particular ideology, right? And less to, to, to what we would consider kind of mainstream nationalism. And then as it turns out, there was a third objective that the party set out to achieve as early as 1930, which it actually achieved in 1975, albeit on, on problematic terms. And that was the liberation and the creation of client regimes in Laos as well as Cambodia. Um, you know, if, if, if any of you have, have studied uh, the history of Vietnamese communism, you will know that, 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 that what is not a Vietnamese communist party um, was actually originally the Indo-Chinese communist party. And that's, that's largely the reason, the, the, the reason why. It was, it, was, it was a Vietnamese, it was a party of Vietnamese communists, but, but, but communists who were, who were committed to the liberation of not only their country, but of the entire Indo-Chinese peninsula. Because, because, because there was a sense that Vietnam would never be able to enjoy the fruits of its independence and, and of communism unless, unless neighboring Laos and Cambodia had, had similarly been liberated and placed under friendly governments, right? So, so, so the, the, the agenda was quite ambitious to, to, to say the least, right? But it's, it's important to understand you know, th this, this revolutionary strategy of the party because it accounts for why they would fight the French for as long as they did and then fight the Americans for as long as they did without ever really wanting any sort of a permanent a diplomatic solution to end the fighting as the Koreans would, for instance, eventually be forced to, to, to accept, right? When, when, when we look at why Hanoi prevails in the end, this commitment to these particular goals is, is, is extremely important to, to, to understand. Um, and, and again, you know, it, the determination to achieve those goals is largely what accounts for, for why Vietnamese history becomes so bloody, so violent in, in the 20th century. Again, you know, the Americans and the French and the Japanese, you know, have, 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 have their share of the blame. But, but I think it, it would be wrong to assume that the Vietnamese were passive victims in all of this, right? Uh, uh, the Vietnamese were, were very active agents in, in their own history. And, and I would argue specifically the Vietnamese Communist Party was a very, very active agent in creating the circumstances that, that led to, to two very tragic wars, uh, first against France and then against, against, against the United States. Uh, um, you're probably familiar with, 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 with the geography of Vietnam, but, but you know, just to give you an idea here, so, so this is kind of, you know, this is Indochina under, under the French, right? So, so, so Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, and Vietnam under France is actually three different pays or countries, right? Tonkin in the north, Annam in the south, and Cochin Xin or Cochin China in, 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 Annam in the center, and Cochin China in, in, in the south, right? So, so, so the French kind of break Vietnam up into three different parts, right? And then, and then, and then, you know, World War II takes place, Japanese occupy, um, it's, it's a great disruption. And then after World War II, France returns, uh, an eight year war is fought. And at the conclusion of that war in 1954, um, uh, from, from three countries, Vietnam is now two countries or two, two, two entities, right? North and, and South. Um, and, and again, as, as some of you might know, um, with the so-called Geneva Accords of 1954 that put an end to the Indochina War, or the first Indochina War involving, involving France, um, um, uh, Northern Vietnam is placed under communist jurisdiction, under the jurisdiction of Ho Chi Minh uh, and, and, and the so-called you know, Vietnamese Communist Party, uh, whereas Southern Vietnam is placed under the jurisdiction of, of I guess what we could call a, a, a nationalist, non-communist regime based in, 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 in Saigon. Um, and, and, you know, they, 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 there was hope domestically and internationally that, that this status quo would, would prevail, uh, but it, it did not. Um, shortly after this partition was, was effected, um, uh, uh, the communist authorities would, would, would resume the military struggle to bring about the realization of, of their grand strategy I addressed, I addressed just moments ago. So <clears throat> uh, essentially what, what, what takes place uh, is, is, is that um, we have a kind of a, a lull in the fighting after the French war comes to an end and Vietnam is, is, is supposedly temporarily partitioned into, 
into, into two regroupment zones or two, two uh, temporary political, political entities. Uh, now, uh, technically, the, the Geneva Accords provided for national elections to take place within two years by 1956 to bring about the, the peaceful reunification of, of, of the country. Um, owing to circumstances, again, those elections don't take place. Um, you know, the, the, the primary obstructionists are the authorities in Saigon and, and, and the Americans. Although, again, you know, Hanoi uh, did very little to make sure that those, those elections would actually take place. Um, but at any rate, the, the elections don't take place. And then shortly afterwards, around 1957 or so, communist insurgents in the South initiate an insurgency to bring about the overthrow of this, of this reactionary regime in Saigon and, and expedite the reunification of Vietnam under, under communist ages. Uh, so, 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 so an insurgency that's, that's, that's effectively local in nature uh, will, will, will become expanded in 1959 when Hanoi decides to actively support the insurgents. Um, uh, starting in, 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 in the middle um, of, 19, of 1959, uh, Northern Vietnam, the regime in Hanoi will start uh, deploying uh, uh, men and, and material to the South via um, um, an, a network of arteries running through Laos and Cambodia that will become known as, as, as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, the situation goes from bad to worse for the authorities in, in, in Saigon. And in the context of the Cold War, uh, which is really heating up at, at the time after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Americans will feel compelled to come to the defense of, of, of the uh, regime in, 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 in Saigon. And essentially, in 1965, with the deployment of the first American combat units to South Vietnam and the onset of US bombings of Northern Vietnam, we effectively witness an Americanization of an ongoing civil war in, in, in Vietnam. Um, and, and, and as it turns out, you know, um, shocking as, as, as it might have appeared, Hanoi actually anticipated uh, an American intervention. Um, when, when Hanoi started deploying troops and supplies to, to the South, um, it, it, it assessed the situation and, and essentially concluded that, that you know, they have a good four to five years to, to complete the liberation of Southern Vietnam. And if, if they fail to do that within those four to five years, then there's a very, very uh, 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 high possibility that the Americans would, would intervene. Uh, and so, and sure enough, you know, the Americans will intervene in full force starting in 65. Uh, but, 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 you know, Hanoi was prepared. Um, actually, Hanoi was, Hanoi actually thought the Americans would invade Northern Vietnam, not simply deploy troops to, to the South, but actually invade the North itself, much as they had done in, in Korea. And that, the fact that it never materialized would come as a great relief to, to the leadership uh, in, 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 in the Northern Vietnamese capital. Uh, now, uh, when, 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 when the war is Americanized, um, and again, that's, to me, that's really, that, that speaks to the, 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 the capabilities, the resourcefulness, uh, the, 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 the experience of, of the leadership in, in, in Hanoi. When, 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 when the war becomes Americanized, um, uh, Hanoi recognizes that, that, that to win this conflict, right, to, to defeat uh, America and its allies and, and bring about the reunification of Vietnam under, under, under communist authority, um, uh, uh, Hanoi will, will have to be resourceful. Um, uh, communist leaders understood that they could not rely on, on military struggle alone to beat the Americans. The Americans were simply too, too mighty, too, too powerful. And so were, were their allies uh, in, 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 in the South. And so, 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 so what Hanoi does to basically offset its own weaknesses, its own limitations, is develop a, a, a strategy 
that's predicated on not one, but three separate modes of struggle. So, so, so the first mode of struggle, um, which, which by official communist account is known as the, the military struggle, essentially entailed uh, uh, pursuing the, the, the annihilation, the attrition of, of, of um, enemy ground forces in the South, uh, and American air forces in the north, right? So, so trying to shoot down as many American airplanes, American aircraft sent to bomb the north, and then trying to kill as many uh, troops as possible who were opposing communist designs in 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 the south, right? So, so this is this is to be expected once once a war breaks out. But but again, right? Because I know understood that this you know, might be problematic against a country as powerful as the US uh, and, 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 and the allies that the Americans were, 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 were patronizing. Um, Hanoi also would place a premium on what it called political struggle, uh, which, which effectively entailed winning hearts and minds to use, to use a, a trope that was quite popular at the time, um, to win over the South Vietnamese population and thus kind of facilitate the recruitment of sympathizers and local guerrilla fighters. Um, now we, 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 we often make a big deal of, 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 of the so-called you know, military contest, the military struggle when we study the Vietnam War, but, but, but it's important for us to understand that for the authorities in Hanoi throughout that war, it's, 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 it's as important, if not more important than fighting to kind of, to, to make sure that, 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 that the Southern masses are with the, 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 commun the so-called communist armies. Um, and, and Hanoi, the, the, the documentary evidence makes that very clear. Hanoi obsessed over kind of, you know, uh, uh, winning over the, 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 the Southern population. Um, and and that 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 would pay dividends in in the end, and then and then and then the the third leg of the struggle, which which I would argue is really where Hanoi won the war, was the so-called diplomatic struggle, and and essentially what that was 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 a, a struggle for hearts and minds outside of of, of Vietnam, uh, and and really my, my 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 research in the archives has been has been focusing on that on that struggle. And, and, and that's the one that I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the realization um, may well have been most consequential in shaping the outcome of, of, of the war. And essentially what diplomatic struggle was, 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 was kind of a globalization of the, of the, of the political struggle. It was, it was, it was you know, this effort, this, this really, really impressive diplomatic effort that Hanoi will undertake to, to secure essentially guns, from certain countries, namely communist states, and then moral and political support from other countries or constituencies, including Americans themselves. Um, essentially, you know, diplomatic struggle entailed trying to rally world opinion uh, behind the Vietnamese cause and then against what American policymakers were doing in Vietnam with a view to, as I would, would, would put it, diplomatically isolating Washington. Um, and, 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 and again, right, I mean, when, 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 when we look at the Vietnam War in its totality uh, and we try to account for the outcome, clearly the military struggle doesn't explain it, right? I mean, uh, by, by, by Hanoi itself has admitted that more than a million North Vietnamese and Viet Cong soldiers were killed during the war, right? Um, American casualties, 58,000, South Vietnamese casualties, approximately 400,000, right? So, so, so clearly, you know, the, the the military contest went as well as it could have gone for the Americans specifically, right? 58,000 killed to a million enemy forces killed, right? So, so to me, that's why, you know, when, when, when you hear some Americans saying we weren't allowed to win in Vietnam, I mean, how could you possibly say that? Militarily, I would argue, the Americans and their allies did everything right in Vietnam. But that's the thing. Hanoi was able to make the military contest inconsequential given its, its strategy. Because, because as it was fighting the war, it also pursued that struggle for hearts and minds in Vietnam and outside of Vietnam. And sure enough, right, outside foreign international pressure on the Americans to desist 
was extremely influential and eventually compelling Nixon to Vietnamize the war and get out of, 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 of Vietnam. Now, this, this, this so-called three modes strategy um, was, not, was, not, was not really uh, you know, a, 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 a Vietnamese creation. Um, it, it, was, it was informed largely by Chinese revolutionary doctrines, specifically Maoist principles. And then, and then, and then the, 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 the communist experience in the war against France, and then, and then the Algerian experience in their war against against the French, uh, it, it, it turns out that that not only are there are there a lot of you know parallels uh, between between the Indochina War and the Algerian War, uh, there was also a lot of back and forth between Algerian revolutionaries and Vietnamese revolutionaries, and and they were learning a lot from each other, um, and and as much as kind of you know the Indochina War would inspire the Algerian War of Independence, uh, the way the Algerians fought would then inspire the Vietnamese in their war against the Americans. It's a really, really interesting story, right? The story of how Vietnam shapes Algeria and then Algeria shapes the Vietnamese revolutionary struggle. And I, I can address, I can say more about that later. But yeah, I've, I've, I've actually gone to Algeria and, and spent some time in, some, in the archives there to kind of elucidate that, that, that aspect. Um, and I thought working in Vietnamese archives was frustrating. Algeria was even more frustrating. And again, I, I, can, I can share more about that with you later. Um, uh, this is a photo from the archives. I really love this photo. Um, you know, Mao uh, and and Le Zuan, the first secretary of the Vietnamese Communist Party, and uh, holding hands, right, like like good good socialist brothers. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's it, and these are key players on 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 both sides. Uh, and 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 the, the holding of hands was was basically a way for the Chinese to kind of tell the Soviets that you know. These are our people, right? As, as you might know, the, the Vietnam War unfolds within the context of the Sino-Soviet split, which is extremely, extremely important in, 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 in explaining why the war turns out the way, the way it does. Um, and and uh, I, I, you, know, I, I, you know, in terms of like new findings, right? I, I'm more and more now I'm thinking that if it wasn't for the Sino-Soviet split, there might never have been a Vietnam War. Uh, but because of the split, the Chinese were willing to give everything to the Vietnamese that the Vietnamese wanted and needed. And then, and then the Soviets had to kind of respond in kind to demonstrate their commitment to the socialist camp. So, 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 so the Vietnamese really took advantage of the split to get, to get all the guns they needed from the Soviets and, 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 and the Chinese. Um, I, on, on, and, and I, when I talk about this with my students, I compare it to like, you know, a, uh, an individual who's courted by two lovers, right? And like, you know, you, you get one rose from one and then you show the other so that you get two roses, right? And that's kind of what Hanoi does with the Soviets and the Chinese, right? Oh, the Chinese are giving us, you know, a ton of guns, right? And they're Chinese. What will you, the Soviets, offer? And that, again, that, that was really, really important in, 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 in expediting Vietnamese uh, goals. Uh, you know, you talk about, you know, the war, the, the one thing that, you know, the war for the Americans was was a limited war, right? As as I'm sure you you know, uh, for for the people of North Vietnam, it was a total war. This was for them, it was World War II, right? It's it's whatever World War II represented for Europeans, let's say, uh, uh, the Vietnam War represented that for the the population of Northern Vietnam, right? Every man, woman, and child became became a fighter. Um, and uh, uh, this is a photo I got from the archives again. Uh, it's it's basically a village militia. Um, uh, sitting on top of a wreck the wreckage of an American aircraft. Um, now, now the, the, you know, the, 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 the caption uh, says that basically this militia shut down the plane. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it, militias don't shoot down American aircraft, right? Um, but, but, you know, it, it, it makes for a great photo opportunity. Um, and and um, uh, it's, I like the photo because, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, th this is, you know, these are the people who are behind the effort, right? I mean, and, 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 and as far as militias are concerned in both the North and the South, I mean, they literally are peasants by day and kind of fighters by night, right? Or, 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 or peasants while there's no bombings and then, and then, and then, and then fighters when, when there are bombings. And I'll say more about the bombings, but, but the bombings were very counterproductive for the Americans in ways that they never realized until it was, it was, it was too late. You know, the, the, the bombings disrupted village life. They made people really, really angry uh, but in terms of the damage they inflicted, um, it was it was relatively inconsequential relative to the anger that they provoked. 
um, or in this case, the joy they caused, right? I mean, that's another thing about the photo. I, that the expressions on these guys is, is, is kind of priceless. Um, now, um, you know, in terms of, of so, so, so we've talked about kind of the grand communist strategy, right? Uh, and, then, and, then, and then the strategy in the war generally. Now, I want to say a few things about, about, about the strategy in the ground war in the South specifically. Uh, so, 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 you know, what, what, what was the strategy for, for basically, you know, winning the ground war in South Vietnam, um, or at least, you know, making a contribution to victory uh, by, by, by engaging um, American ground forces and, and, and their, their, their allies. So, so uh, communist authorities are very, very clear. Um, the, the, uh, that their strategy in the South, and again, right, it's interesting because as much as we've written and read about Vietnam, we, we, we you've probably never seen this 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 particular expression, uh, but but it's 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 all over the archives. It's all over you know Vietnamese texts about about military history. Um, this this idea of, of the three spearhead attack, right? The three pronged attack or the three front attack, right? Um, again. Military, political, and, and in the context of the war in the South specifically, military proselytization. I'll tell you more about that in a moment, but that's that's an absolutely central element in the communist strategy in southern in southern Vietnam, right? And then so so uh, I've I've actually and I've, I've listed here uh, the 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 equivalent in in Vietnamese, and that's the thing when 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 official sources or or, or the party uh, uh, discuss the war and the strategy in the South. This, this is, this is, this is, you know, this is it, you know. So the Americans are their search and destroy strategy, and then, and then this is what call it the equivalent for, 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 for the, the forces supportive of Hanoi's agenda, right? The, the three spearhead attack, and and what's interesting, and and this is lost on a lot of people who study the war, is that ultimately the most fundamental aim in in, in the war for 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 Hanoi was not killing Americans. It was basically killing Vietnamese serving in the South Vietnamese army. It was, it was, it was, it was kind of, you know, as, as, I, as, I, as, as, as this quote indicates, it was to destroy and disintegrate the majority of the puppet army, the South Vietnamese army, right? And destroy only part of the American army. The Americans were never the core goal here. They, never, they were never the core target, again, because Hanoi understood that 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 the odds of defeating the Americans militarily were slim to 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 nil, right? But 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 the, the South Vietnamese army was much more vulnerable, and 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 there was a sense that if we can somehow disintegrate this army, right, then the Americans would have no reason to keep fighting, and we would win the war, right? So so as much as we make the American war, right, when, when we when we see images of the Vietnam War, it, it's always you know white guys against Asian guys, right? Americans against Vietnamese. On a day-to-day -day basis, there was much more fighting, there was much more Vietnamese on Vietnamese violence than there ever was Vietnamese on American, American on Vietnamese, or at least communist Vietnamese violence. So, so, so the, and, and, and you know, from very early on, Hanoi establishes that the, the key to victory in the military struggle is disintegration of the so-called puppet army, right? And, and again, because Hanoi recognizes that 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 army, you know, which may not be as 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 intimidating as the American army, is still very well equipped. Hanoi decides to introduce a particular form of struggle to undermine that army from within, and and that's what they call. So so you've got the name up here in Vietnamese, right? Bing Dick Van, right? Which which. It's very hard to translate because it's a very it's a very Vietnamese communist expression, right? But it, it's basically it's basically you know military proselytization and propaganda work among enemy forces. So so the idea was to kind of infiltrate, right, the South Vietnamese army, and then and then and then very often by by enlisting or volunteering or getting drafted into the South Vietnamese army, and then and then kind of talking to your buddies. During basic training, right uh, in the barracks, when you're resting, about the fact that are we really fighting for the right side? Maybe we shouldn't do this, and kind of undermining morale from within, right? And again, right when 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 Americans, when Westerners write about the Vietnam War, 
they, they, they almost invariably talk about the poor performance of the South Vietnamese army, right? And how South Vietnamese soldiers were constantly going AWOL, were constantly kind of, you know, abandoning their posts. And, and what, I would, what I would suggest to you, what I would submit to you is that, is that this was not a random occurrence. This was not the South Vietnamese soldiers being lazy, inferior. This was actually a, a, a deliberate act on Hanoi's part that actually paid significant dividends. Um, and, 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 and again, this is a, a, a technique that, that the communists were really good at because they worked on it for eight years in the war against the French. Uh, if you're familiar with the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, you know, the, the French had all these outposts they set up, right, in 54 at, at Dien Bien Phu. The, 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 the Viet Minh at the time took an entire hill without losing a, a single casualty by using this particular tactic. There was a hill at Dien Bien Phu that was defended by local forces. And essentially, before assaulting it, the Viet Minh infiltrated the perimeter with one individual who talked the, the defenders into basically leaving and abandoning their posts. So, so, so the same the same strategy was applied during the war against against the Americans, and directed specifically at the South Vietnamese army. So, so, so Bing Dick Van, it's 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 a uh, and and and, but in, and again it's, it's something we never talk about in Western texts of the war. When you read a Vietnamese account of the war and why they won, it it figures extremely prominently. They've written at length about this, and it's something that communist authorities are really really proud of because they see it as central to the achievement of, of their purposes in, in, in the Vietnam War. Another element I want to underscore that we tend to ignore is that fact that as much as we think of Vietnam as a guerrilla war, for, 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 for communist leaders in Hanoi, right, for, for the authorities managing the war in Hanoi, and all that, you know, that war was really managed in, in Hanoi, conventional action was considered just as important. So, so, so again, it's really wrong to think of Vietnam as, you know, these guys in black pajamas with no training going out there trying to, you know, lay booby traps to kill Americans. As it turns out, during the Vietnam War, uh, by, by official communist account, uh, there were more than 50 large scale so-called mass combat operations um, uh, lasting anywhere from five days to 10 months. Um, the leaders in Hanoi, I, I, I'll say a few things about their armies in a moment, but, but they had at their disposal some really, really great soldiers um, um, and, 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 and made, it, made, made full use of them, uh, including in conventional battles. Uh, so, so, so it's important to stop thinking about Vietnam as just you know, a low level guerrilla war. It turns out that, that, that it was a war that was marked by a number of conventional operations, most of which were again initiated by the authorities in, 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 in Hanoi. Uh, now again, just to elucidate something, um, just so that you know we're, we're clear about 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 why some of these things are possible, um, and and to give you an insight also into into what's going on on the other side, um, so-called so so you know individual men and women who were fighting were not communists, rarely if ever, but but they were led by communists, right? And that's the thing: soldiers, or you know, never act on their own; they answer to authorities somewhere, right? And so 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 you know, I, I use the term communist armies. Because because their armies controlled by communist authorities, but then but then I'll say I'll say a few things about motivations. Most of the people who fight in those armies are not communists themselves, right? Only those who lead them. So 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 so-called communist led forces in South Vietnam consist of two armies and three formations, right? So so the two armies are the North Vietnamese Army, right? The Professional Army of Northern Vietnam, and then and then and then the so-called Viet Cong, which is which is which is local. South Vietnamese insurgents, right? So, so those are the two armies, right? So, so, so the, the, the People's Army of Vietnam from the north, and then the Viet Cong from the south. And by the way, the, the, officially, the Viet Cong Army is known as the Liberation Armed Forces, the, the, the LAF, the Liberation Armed Forces. So two armies, and then three formations, right? The first formation, so-called regular and main forces, right? Uh, so so are ba those, are, those are basically North Vietnamese Army regulars and elite Viet Cong troops, right? They're, they're, they're very well equipped uh, and they're, they're extremely, extremely well trained and highly disciplined. Uh, and, and I would argue that, that, that they're, they're better trained than their American counterparts um, uh, in terms of weapons. Again, despite what we often hear, uh, that, that their weaponry is as good 
as, as, as that of the Americans, at least the small arms and the light weapons. Uh, and, and the discipline is, is astounding. Hanoi always put a premium on discipline. And, and again, as disciplined as Western armies and the American army was in Vietnam, despite certain irrigate, I would argue that, that, that these main forces were even more disciplined than, than, than the American, their American and South Vietnamese counterparts. Second formation, the so-called regional and local forces, those, those were kind of you know, uh, uh, second line defense troops or professional guerrillas that operated locally in their home provinces. Um, now, some of these units were very good, others were very bad. You know, the, it, it varied greatly depending on the kind of training they'd received, how many casualties they, they, they suffered. And, and those guys, these professional guerrillas, usually would support regular forces or else engage the enemy, but, but really it, only in ambush style attacks because they, did, they lacked the resources or the training to actually participate in conventional battles, right? And, th and then there were the popular forces, right? The village defense and other militias uh, were very poorly trained, very poorly equipped, worked the fields by day, worked booby traps by night, but then ultimately played a vital role in the war by providing incredibly, immeasurably important assistance, especially information to, to, to regular forces and regional forces. But, but see, that's the thing, right? When, when we think about the Vietnam War and America's enemies, we think about basically the popular forces, right? Like men and women in black pajamas. And, and that's the thing, those, those guys don't really fight the Americans. It's the main forces, right? Who, who do the bulk of the fighting. And as I said, those are extremely, extremely well-trained. Um, so, you know, these images of, you know, the poor peasant and it's all propaganda on the one hand or else kind of, you know, stereotyping, borderline racist stereotyping on our, on our, on our parts, right? Uh, you know, talk about conventional operations, right? This is the Tet Offensive, which I'm assuming you're all familiar with. Um, so, so it's 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 one of the, the the major conventional operations launched by Hanoi. But again, right, just all this to say that again for Hanoi, conventional operations were as important as daily guerrilla guerrilla operations. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say a few things about this, and then and then and then I'm 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 gonna conclude. So, why were people fighting, right? Which is an important one. So. So when you look at North Vietnamese soldiers, when you look at Northern troops, right? It's true that most of those guys are volunteers, right? It's, but, but, that's, but, but the thing is this, right? And I've, I've, I've talked at length with, with uh, veterans in, in Northern Vietnam. They're volunteers because they know they're gonna get drafted. And it's gonna look a hell of a lot better for them and their families if they volunteer before getting drafted, right? So, 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 and, and then, and then, you know, teachers would put tremendous pressure on students to volunteer for service instead of waiting to be to be to be drafted. Relatives, right, would would often tell you know an 18 year old boy that, well, you know, I fought the French. It's your turn to fight the Americans, right? So, so it turns out, just like, you know, soldiers in in any war, most of these kids don't want to be there, right? But they are because. The nation is calling, and then they're facing all kinds of pressures from everywhere to volunteer, right, and not wait to be to be to be drafted, right. And then, and then, as I mentioned earlier, there was the American bombing, right. So, so for for those of us who know the history, the Americans are bombing the North to punish it for its support of the South, right, which is a legitimate reason. But if you are a North Vietnamese civilian, that's all lost on you, as far as you're concerned. Here you are mining your field, and all of a sudden your life is disrupted because the Americans are bombing you for no reason. Beyond that, the bombing split into the, the Hanoi narrative that, that, that the Americans are evil imperialists who are here for no reason. So, so, so I would argue that the bombing was counterproductive in the sense that, that the, the, the propaganda value it served for Hanoi outweighed whatever physical damage it caused. Now, for Southerners, for, for the so-called Viet Cong, some of them were coerced, were forced into joining the Viet Cong, but then most of them are volunteers with a personal vendetta against Saigon of the Americans, right? So, 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 you know, the Americans killed my father, you know, how dare these, you know, white devils kill my father, right? So, so then I would join the Viet Cong, right? So, so, uh, or else, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to fight for the South Vietnamese army, right? So, so I, I know as an 18 year old, I'm likely to be forced to fight. So, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to join the Viet Cong instead of, of the South Vietnamese army. Uh, sometimes, you know, the communists will promise my family land if I, if I, if I, if I join, 
or else I'm just bored with village life. Uh, you know, and, and, that, and that's actually an important element. You know, we, so, so what, what's interesting when you look at soldiers from the North and the South, no one fights or very few people fight because, you know, that's what we Vietnamese do. They, they, you know, just like Americans, just like, you know, yes, we believe in God and country or, you know, whatever, but then, but then there, there's always kind of a practical reason, a more self-solving reason to, to, to join, right? And then a few words about, about women, as you know, many women would 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 would, would engage uh, in 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 the war in various capacities. Uh, a lot of them uh, we 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 we're finding out are, are doing so mostly because they just want to be emancipated, and 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 becoming a, a a fighter, a sympathizer. You know, allow them to not marry this guy their their parents wanted them to marry, or just again to kind of escape the drudgery of of, of village life. A lot of women became cadres. Uh, or else they, came, they became combat medics, nurses, logistical experts, uh, um, um, informants, spies, moles. Um, you know, you, you, very few women were actually soldiers, were actually fighters. Um, most, but, 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 but they, they played a, a very, very important role serving in other capacities. Um, again, these are from the archives in, in Hanoi, right? And, you know, the great photo, right? Kids helping firemen put out a fire. But again, it's these things, right? If you're a kid, right? You know, all of a sudden, you you know, you're, the, the, the village communal house is on fire. It's been bombed. You don't know why. You just see this American aircraft, right? And so, so when you're of age, you know, you're you're kind of happy to go back and and give the Americans a taste of their own medicine, right? Um, this is a village militia having lunch. Um, you know, and and that's you know that's life under under the bombs, right? It's 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 you get together, you hide, you eat lunch, and then you go back to the fields, you do whatever. But they, you know. Emotionally, it takes a toll, right? And and at first, you, you want to do something about it. So so again, like a lot of young men would 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 be happy to volunteer because it was a way to kind of protect their families, right? Indirectly. Um, I really like this picture. You know, you talk about determination, right? So so this is the wing of a B-52, um, and here are these guys plowing the fields despite you know that plane being right there. And that's the thing, right? That, that, that Hanoi was able to kind of mobilize not just soldiers but its whole civilian population. So, 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 you know, despite, you know, the North being a war zone, life continues because it has to, we still have to produce food. We still have to, to, to go about our daily, our daily, our daily business. So, so determination, resilience, again, very often compelled by Hanoi is, is, is an important factor in all of this. Uh, again, if you, if you've taught, you know, this, this story, if you know about the story, women always figure prominently, right, in, 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 in these images, right? Uh, you've probably seen this one here, right? This I, I know from talking to people. This was staged, uh, as as is this stuff, right? It's it's you know again, you know women did carry guns, um, but but they rarely participated in combat. They, they tended to play other roles outside of of of, of combat. But Hanoi like this image of a female fighter because it made the Americans look even worse, right? These bad, big bad Americans are fighting innocent women, just trying to protect their 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 their, their children, their families. Um, I love this picture. Uh, I got this from the archives. Uh, you know, we always have this idea of you know the, the northern soldier as an angry. I, I don't know how well you can see just a bunch of kids going into combat. These are north. It's it's it's, it's a North Vietnamese uh, army platoon. They're walking towards Saigon, and the expression on their faces. I mean, they look like kids. They look like like you know like babies. And and uh, you know, it's not a propaganda. You know, in in most images we see, it's always propaganda images, right? Because the North controlled information. They're smiling or whatever. These kids just have this blank look on their faces. It's such a great photo. It's a really really great photo. Um, I'm gonna leave you with this because uh, I'm already five minutes over time. Why Hanoi won? Uh, I would argue number one, superior strategy. Number two, superior diplomacy. Number three, superior leadership. And number three, number four, superior fighters. Again, I don't want to offend Americans or anybody, but but you know these guys, they really knew what they were doing. I mean, maybe they weren't better than Americans, but they they were much better than we think traditionally. And and you know they were determined to win. But again, not because of some innate characteristic, but because the authorities managed the war effort really well. Actually, one more thing, I'm going to leave you with Yanis, and then I'm I'm going to shut up. I promise. Determined to fight, determined to win. Right. To tell you how powerful the slogan was. So this is a part of a COVID campaign, right? In the, as you know, the Vietnamese have been very good at fighting COVID, right? If you look up here, basically the slogan they're using to fight COVID is determined to fight, determined to win. 
that even my Vietnamese colleagues, you know, didn't realize this. I had to point it out to them. I said that, that your slogan for COVID is the same one that communist authorities used in the war against the Americans. The Quiet Tang, you know, determined to fight, determined to win. And so, so, you know, I mean, if, if you don't believe me that determined to fight, determined to win worked and played a role, well, you know, at least understand that from the perspective of communist authorities in Vietnam, clearly it worked because they recycled it to fight COVID and they've done a wonderful job of wiping out COVID. All right, I'm gonna end here. Thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Pierre, for uh, an amazingly interesting lecture. So in my introduction today to the conference, I, I said that part of the, um, of the problem that we're going to be exploring is how does ideology become military strategy and uh, and i think you you addressed that brilliantly in this talk um one of the things i highlighted here in my notes is that um you said that um, ho chi Minh was a committed marxist leninist and this reminded me of the time when i when i started to do my my phd in, in soviet history and um, my background was not in Soviet history. It was a political science and intellectual history, but I became interested in communism, so I thought I would do a PhD in Soviet history. So I was reading, I was doing my literature review and I was reading review articles and all the things that, you know, conscientious first year PhD students ought to read. And a lot of what these, you know, very um, high ranking scholars were saying was that now that the archives are opened, what we found out is that these people were actually Marxist-Leninists. So I thought, wow, the, the greatest discovery to come out of the Soviet archives was that the Soviet Union was led by communists. Maybe <laughs> this is not a very interesting field after all. But um, I think it's really important because it, it, it gives you a sense of how communism was indeed a, a global revolutionary movement. And yeah. it's still, um, the history of communism is still very much um, compartmentalized into national histories of yes. Vietnam, China, and Russia. And that's, I, I mean, this probably has to do a lot with language skills that are required yep. to do the studies. But one major commonality in all of these is that you have a group of very committed revolutionaries with a clear idea of what they want to do. They have a theory. The, the notion of scientific socialism, right? You, you study what you want to change and you change it based on a plan. And that's a common feature in all in all communist society, in all communist movements, at least for the ones that we are um, somewhat successful. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the comment. I, I'll go, um, I'll move on to the question. So I'm, I was wondering if um, you could give us a better idea of what the military structure of, of the of the communist forces was in terms of things like I don't know the, the party presence within um, within the units maybe political officers yeah that sort of thing so you talked a bit about the the structure at formation and army level but uh, maybe a bit more um, fine grained stuff so so I, I I I think I think this this is a Soviet model right so so in in every military unit the 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 military commander has a political counterpart, right? So, so, so at the division level, let's say the division commander will have a, a political counterpart, right? So, and one will be in charge of military strategy, the other will be in charge of industri in indoctrination, political strategy, right? And then during the war, if, if conditions permit, you would have this, like a, a political presence down to the platoon level. Um, and, and, and again, in terms of why communists fought so well, um, I would argue that the presence of, of what they called the political commissar inside units made a really, really big difference. Now, now when, when, when we think about the political commissar, right, we think someone who's very, about someone who's very ideologically rigid and so on and so forth, right? But, but as it turns out, from, from what we understand of the Vietnamese experience, the commissar essentially serves as, you know, is a combination of, of is the political officer, but he's also the, the, the unit psychologist, he's the unit chaplain, and, and a lot of North Vietnamese soldiers have said he's like the father figure sometimes. Yeah. So, so and, and the commissar would facilitate these criticism and self-criticism sessions after engagements. 
so again, right, for, for, for all the flaws of the communist system, one of the one of the really interesting things that it introduces, right, is this idea of criticism and self-criticism, right? Where where we meet regularly to discuss what we've done wrong. And it turns out that that let's say a North Vietnamese unit after combat would get together and conduct these sessions moderated by the commissar. And during the session, basically the, the rank and file could tell the officer what the officer had done wrong and should do better next time. And imagine that, right? Militaries don't allow for this, but but it was a and, and then the commissar would moderate the discussion, right? And so that, that's why the more they fought, the better they, they became at it. And that's why I would say they're, they're better fighters because remember, they fight the French for eight years, right? The veterans of that war are training the kids who go and fight the Americans. Imagine all the knowledge they have, right? And then those kids who fight the Americans are not there for 13 months or 12 months like the Americans are. They're there for the duration. After five years, between the training you've received from someone who fought the French for eight years, right? And, and the experience you have having fought for five years, I mean, you're, again, as good as the American might be, he'll be no match for, for your resourcefulness, right? But again, the presence of that commissar, the, the, these political cadres throughout the military, they do indoctrinate, but, but they, they serve a role that goes well beyond that. This role of, this idea of a father figure is, is, is a theme that's kind of recurrent in testimonies of, 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 of veterans. Some commissars were really rigid and very unpleasant, but others were, were like, oh, I, did you have a bad day? And, you know, well, you'll be okay. And they, they loved having those guys around. So, so yeah, that's, that structure, it's very rigid. It's very, but at the same time, it allowed for flexibility that, 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 that did favorable things for communist armies. I mean, they, ultimately, and it's right, they're human too. They're not automatons, right? They're not, you know, yeah, communism produces its fair share of, of, of you know, new men and women. But, but, you know, in combat, the humanity of individuals very often will come to the fore. And that's the thing. These guys were as human as, as the Americans they were fighting. Excellent. Um, I am actually, this is exactly the sense I get from studying the Red Army as well. But um, the commissar is this sort of, unit psychologist slash father figure as well as political educator and sometimes annoying person <laughs> but, um, they do they do have this very sort of well-respected position in the military yeah. and obviously when when you're in a situation like the vietnam war when you're actually fighting a war that is um probably justly perceived as a foreign invasion as well then these things become much more important than yeah say when you're just doing a military service in times of peace, of course. Yeah, exactly, yes. Excellent, so um, we have a question for you from Alan. My question is basically on what you think the Americans could have done. So for example, I see parallels in my own um, area of research on the Eastern Front. So obviously you had the Germans going in and they had a choice. They were either going to uh, try to win people over with a, a hearts and minds policy. So go in and you know befriend the Ukrainians or the peoples of the Baltic states or whatever. But it's one of my biggest bugbears when I research the Eastern Front because you literally read this in every single book in the literature. Everybody always, always says, oh, the Germans uh, should have befriended the Ukrainians. The Germans should have befriended the, the peoples of the Baltic states. But my counter argument to that is always, well, if they had done that, then they wouldn't have been Nazis. You know, the whole idea of, of being a Nazi was that they were going to go in and, and take the stand from these people anyway. So that's always my counter argument to that. And I'm just wondering uh, what's your opinion on what then could the Americans have done to counter North Vietnamese uh, propaganda? Uh, could they have gone in maybe uh, with their own propaganda department to try to counter uh, what the North Vietnamese were doing? That, that, that's a, a great question, Alan. So, so the Americans kind of attempted, you know, through the, a program they call pacification, to 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 kind of neutralize the the, 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 the you know the the, the, the communist-led struggle for for hearts and minds. Uh, the, but the problem, I think, for the Americans is kind of the same problems that they they they've had in Iraq and Afghanistan. Is that you know they go in there and and 
you know, you, you have, you know, a hand, only a handful of Americans actually speak Vietnamese, only a handful of Americans who understand, you know, the, the, the people they're dealing with. And, and, and there's no, you know, there's no really systematic effort to learn to engage the Vietnamese on, on, on their own terms, right? So, so, so I, I think, I think that, you know, whatever the Americans would do, it was, it was bound to come up short. Now they would often try to work through the South Vietnamese, right? Through their South Vietnamese allies. Um, but, but then, but then the Americans had such a condescending attitude that, 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 that the, 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 the relationship between, between they and their own allies was, it was always kind of a, a difficult and a, and a, and a, and a, and a challenging one. So, uh, you know, the question is, is a very good one, but I, I just think, Alan, that, that, you know, I, I don't see what else the Americans could have done. You know, there, there, there is, you know, if, because I know it chose to fight, so the thing, and Hanoi played to its own strengths and, and, and sought to exploit American vulnerabilities. Um, and, and, and I, I think that, you know, absent this effort on the Americans to kind of more widely kind of, you know, explore the culture, train linguists, um, there was, there, 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 there was very little that, that, that they, they, they could do. And, 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 you know, and if you look at Iraq and Afghanistan, I, I would argue, you know, this, the same thing happened there, right? I mean, it's very hard to fight a war that's, that's, that's not just a military contest if you're just not prepared to fight on the political, cultural, and, and mm -hmm. these, these other fronts, right? And, and to me, that's, that, that's, that's the credit I give to Hanoi. They, they recognized, they were aware of their own limitations. And so and whereas the Americans thought that, you know, this could be solved by military means, means alone. Um, so, so, you know, yes, there's always things the Americans could have done different, but I, I think that in the end, you know, you, you just have to say that they were just bested by an enemy that proved more resourceful, more competent and, 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 and better prepared. I don't right. know if I, I'm answering your question, Alan. No, you have absolutely, but I, I think, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's why we're all here today because Military historians tend to overlook the uh, ideological part of war. Uh, it can be just as important, if not uh, uh, more important, uh, in, in many, if not most, wars. And again, to, uh, to reiterate the, the parallel with the Eastern Front, it's just simply that if the Americans didn't have the heart, really, to, beginning to, to, to begin with, if they didn't have the heart to just try to uh, counter this uh, North Vietnamese propaganda. It, it was just doomed to fail then from, from the beginning. Yeah. And I, but I, I, and that's, to me, that's the thing, right? When you look at the United States and even today, right? That's this, this idea that somehow militarily all the big problems of the world can be solved, including wars. It's, Vietnam has shown that, you know, wars are more than a military contest. And, and so, so, so to me, you know, I, again, right? I, I think I think we just we just need to consider the fact that maybe we, we need to give Hanoi the credit because it it deliberately you know went for those those soft spots if you will mm -hmm. uh, of, of 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 the Americans. Hello, uh, that was thank you very much, Pierre. That was a, a fascinating um, paper. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, my own uh, research uh, overlaps somewhat with your own, um, particularly when it comes to hearts and minds, because. My research is, uh, focuses on humanitarianism and uh, particularly humanitarianism in conflict. And there's this idea that very many militaries all over the world uh, get into their head that uh, it's impossible to win any sort of foreign conflict um, uh, involving local populations unless you're also having some sort of outreach uh, program to try and exactly that win over their hearts and minds. But the truth is that nobody has ever done it properly. It's never been done properly. It's a totally failed and flawed ideology, starting with the British in Malaysia and moving, uh, you know, through Vietnam. And even now, you know, all the way up to Vietnam and Afghanistan, sorry, to Afghanistan and uh, Iraq, like you were saying, because the truth is that uh, people who don't, and you touched upon this yourself, um, uh, invaders, if you want, who don't know the language, don't know the culture, are not going to be able to predict uh, uh, what it is that the local community truly needs and wants. So, you know, the, the things that your average 22 year old lieutenant from the American military uh, thinks that the people might need may in actual fact be completely different to what the people themselves really want. So the home field advantage for uh, militaries defending their own territory and uh, working within their own communities is almost insurmountable uh, yeah. when it comes to, to hearts and minds. And that's why, for instance, you can see 
the uh, the American military still being bogged down 12 years later in Afghanistan and why you know it's not that the Taliban have some sort of ide ideology that is just so inherently attractive to the uh, to the people of Afghanistan it's that they speak the language they yeah. understand the culture they know what the people want so um the yeah, to hearts and minds it, it's very popular and you, you, even to this day despite the fact that it's never been done properly you know you hear it all the time and if you ever spend any time with uh, modern militaries you know it's something that everybody from from uh, left lowest lieutenant all the way to the highest general that they consistently bring it up and speak about it as if it's a strategy or, uh, that can be implemented correctly it's a good point point. and Ronald, i would say you no know, in vietnam the, the, the one thing that worked very well for the americans was the, the special forces guys they would embed with They'd minorities right mm -hmm. but that was the thing right those were ethnic minorities who didn't care much for the Vietnamese, right? So, so they, they, many of them had worked with the French and they would gladly work with the Americans to kill Vietnamese, right? But, but I, you know, the special forces guys would basically be living with these villagers, right? Uh, and, and I mean, there was a very dangerous assignment. Most of them, you know, would eventually kind of be, be accepted by the village. But then usually what happened was this, right? But then, you know, a US Army unit would come in and basically, you know, by treating the villagers like they were enemies, kind of undo all the goodwill, all the work that had been done by the special forces guys. But, you know, if, if, if the, the special forces model had been applied on a wider scale, perhaps things would have been different. But as you point out, Ronan, I think you're, it, it's just, you know, Westerners are not willing to make that investment, right? Because it, it's, it's time consuming and it doesn't pay dividends right away, right? But, you know, body counts, that's how, you know, we think we can actually more easily measure progress in the war. And, and that's that's not the case. It's 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 uh, we want to see dividends immediately. Right. And yeah. I think that was the problem with Vietnam, as it is with Iraq and Afghanistan. If you don't train people to really understand local local individuals, then 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 you're, you're it's going to be you have a really hard time prevailing. There, there's, one, there's one other uh, thing very briefly on the on the hearts and minds that uh, uh, some of the participants might find interesting is that you can create uh, um, essentially a market for uh, these outreach programs. So you have uh, situations, for instance, we can you know look again at the Afghan example. So uh, a lot of the problems over the last 15 years, the, the military problems that faced by NATO are in the south of the country. So suddenly you have these uh, um, you know attacks going on in Mazar -e Sharif, and you find out really what's happening in the north. And what's really happening is that the people have figured out that unless there's violence, then the NATO forces will have no interest in spending any money in their That's in their so areas. So they let off a couple of bombs, you know, they make a few threats, a bit like the IRA in Canary Wharf, just to let everybody know we're still here. You know, spend some money up here as well, or you're also going to face the same trouble. So you actually end up incentivizing violence as opposed to. Uh, Disincentivizing. That's so interesting. Thanks, Ron. That's really, really interesting. Thanks, uh, Pierre. Um, I believe we are now out of time for the session. So, can we maybe have a short break and reconvene at half past for our next panel? Yes. Excellent. So, um, see you soon. Thanks, Thanks again, Pierre. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. For I really appreciate. Thank you so much. Great questions were great. Thank you.